Hi, hello, and a very good evening. I extend a warm welcome to today's iFocus online session, episode number 386 and oculoplasty module number 61. Today, we have the International Masterclass by Dr. Richard Allen on the inherited eyelid, lacrimal, and orbital conditions. A brief introduction about Dr. Allen. Dr. Allen did his MD and PhD from Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, his ophthalmology residency and fellowship in oculoplastic surgery at the University of Iowa under the mentorship of Dr. Jeffrey Nerud and Dr. Keith Carter. Currently, he's working as an oculoplastic surgeon at Texas Oculoplastics Consultants in Austin and professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Texas Dell Medical School. He was the former Carolyn E. Sorry, F. Ellis Professor of Ophthalmology at Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, his alma mater. Uh, he was the immediate past president of the ASOPRS, editor in chief for the journal Orbit. He has authored over 125 peer reviewed publications. He's the editor for Oculoplastics and Orbit section in the current opinion in ophthalmology. He's the editorial board member for Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery and Ophthalmology and Therapy Journal. And he's a reviewer for over 30 ophthalmology journals. He has delivered extensive lectures nationally and internationally, and he's known for his internationally acclaimed online ophthalmoplastic surgery video atlas. Thank you very much, sir. It's an honor to have you online in our session. Over to you. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to be here tonight. <laughs> And what I'd like to talk about today are some inherited conditions of that we encounter in oculoplastic surgery. And, you know, I think that this is this is something that's near and dear to me. I, I did my PhD in genetics, and so I always like to, um, you know, remember those days and then also make sure that I understand the conditions that are associated with the subspecialty that I've chosen. And I do a lot of pediatric oculoplastics, and so I see a lot of inherited conditions. And I think it's hard because, you know, in oculoplastic surgery, we often talk a lot about surgery, but today we're not going to talk so much about surgery. I'm not even going to show you any videos, which is a rarity in my lectures. I'm going to talk about uh, these conditions that we see that are inherited. And I'd like to convince you that, you know, there's actually a relatively straightforward way to, uh, to remember these and also approach these. I have no financial disclosures. So I think first and foremost, it's always important to ask ourselves, you know, why should I care about this other than, you know, encountering it on an exam or a test? You know, why should I care about these relatively rare conditions? Because realistically, inherited disorders should be rare, especially if they affect, uh, the uh, life or even the reproduction of the affected individual. Well, first and foremost, I mean, appropriate diagnosis leads to appropriate treatment. And what I mean by that is that you need to know what the condition is so that you treat the patient appropriately with this for that condition. And we'll talk about this later. In addition, there's also some other organ system findings that are associated with these conditions. So the last thing you wanna do is miss some potentially, um, you know, other conditions that are associated with these problems that could cause problems for the patient. It's always nice also to have an idea of, with, of, of prognosis for the conditions. So you need an, a, an accurate diagnosis. It's also important for counseling for family members. And lastly, I think realistically, you know, even though we are all surgeons in the sense that, you know, we are in a surgical specialty and oculoplastic surgery is a surgical subspecialty, I think realistically we need to know that we need to know that you know the goal really is not to treat patients surgically the goal really would be to treat many of these things medically so if we can develop molecular treatments to these problems that would be better than putting patients through surgery i know that sounds uh, sacrilege but i mean i i truly believe that you know especially in our treatment of cancer we should be treating these patients with molecular therapies rather than continuing to treat them with essentially amputation um, I think all of you know the terminology with regards to genetics. First and foremost, mode of inheritance. Usually we're going to split that up into autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked, or even potentially maternal for mitochondrial DNA disorders. 
Penetrance basically means whether an individual that carries a mutation has any sign of the disease. So there's some diseases that have 100% penetrance, meaning that if you carry that mutation, you will show some sign of that disease at some point in your life. And then you have expression, which basically means that the signs of the disease may be variable between patients. So even though patients may have the disease, even within a family, the expression may be different. So when we talk about inherited disorders that affect oculoplastic surgery, realistically, we're talking about eyelid, lacrimal, and orbital disorders. And we're going to start with eyelid conditions. And the way in which I classify these are basically congenital rare, non-congenital rare, congenital very rare, and then non-congenital very rare. So really, we're not going to talk about any of the very rare conditions today. We're just going to talk about these congenital and non-congenital uh, inherited eyelid conditions that are by definition rare. So when we think about congenital rare eyelid conditions, I think the four most common ones are the ones that I encounter the most as an oculoplastic surgeon are blepharophimosis, ptosis, epicanthus inversus syndrome, congenital fibrosis of the extra ocular muscles, lymphedema dystichiasis syndrome, and then congenital myasthenic syndrome. I, congenital, congenital myasthenic syndrome, though, could realistically be a very rare condition. So BPES, I think that's our classic, um, you know, really our classic genetic condition in oculoplastic surgery. So these patients have blepharophimosis, ptosis, epicanthus inversus, and also lateral ectropion. It is an autosomal dominant condition, and the gene has been identified, and it's the FOXL2 gene. There is significant variability of expression in these patients. And basically, when we think about BPES, we split them up into either type 1 or type 2, depending upon the mutation that they have. It's really important to know that in type 1 patients, females can have premature ovarian failure. And that's something that needs to be discussed in any female patient that you have with BPES. And so this can lead to female infertility. So this is sort of our classic, uh, you know, picture of a patient with BPS. So if we look here, she has ptosis. She's already had a, a ptosis surgery. You can see the scar along her eyelid. She has epicanthus inversus. She has this lateral ectropion. Her blepharophimosis, though, isn't too bad realistically. Now, interestingly, when she came to my clinic, her mom brought me this pedigree, and she, her mom was understandably concerned. Here is the pro, de, pro band down here uh, on the bottom. Here is her mom. And then if we look at this pedigree, what you will notice that is that every female that is affected has no children. So this is type one. This is basically premature ovarian failure. So her mom was understandably uh, worried about her daughter having premature ovarian failure. And so, you know, basically I sent the, the daughter to the endocrinologist as well as the pediatric gynecologist to get this uh, checked. But again, something that needs to be discussed with any female patient in particular that has BPES, look at the pedigree. If you see that the gene has been passed through the females, I don't worry about it too much, but you know, really sort of try to understand whether there's female infertility in the pedigree. So how do we treat this? You know, First and foremost, we want to treat the ptosis and any canthal abnormalities. And the goal more than anything else is preserved visual development. Amblyopia is pretty high in BPES, as high as 56%. So many of us, uh, there's lots of discussions with regards to the sequence of surgeries in these patients, but I think first and foremost, we're going to preserve visual development. So that means ptosis surgery, then potentially correct the medial canthus later, and that can either be the mustarde four flap technique, but realistically, I've been doing a lot of lower lid skin redraping lately. And then also um, looking at lateral ectropion. So here's a patient before and after his ptosis surgery. Often we're going to do some type of frontalis suspension in these patients, more commonly frontalis flaps lately. Um, and then, you know, I, I do a lot of um, surgeries in which I do both the ptosis and the medial campus at the same time. People used to think that you had to split that up, but I think now I often will do it uh, concurrently. Um, but, you know, realistically, what we're trying to do is get the eyelids elevated for visual development. And then you can also see this patient has this lateral ectropion that 
probably will need to be fixed later as well. So I'm not going to show this video, but this is just sort of the old four flap, uh, you know, must start a jumping man four flap technique. So this is a, a, a Y to V double Z plasty for BPES. And, um, you know, realistically, these patients do pretty well, but I'd probably do more skin redraping at this point. And so here's a patient before and after she had her frontalis suspension redone. She had her medial canthus taken care of. But, you know, again, some of this lateral lower lid, almost more of a ectropion or retraction or Uri blepharon more than anything else, but not so much blepharophimosis in her. So the second thing we're going to talk about is congenital fibrosis of the extraocular muscles. So this is bilateral myogenic ptosis with restricted external ophthalmoplegia. Again, these should be non-progressive, three types. And, you know, when we start thinking about some of these disorders, really what we're thinking about are congenital cranial disinnervation disorders. So CCDDs, which basically are disturbances in cranial nerve development. So the classic form of C at CFEOM is uh, CFEOM type one, autosomal dominant, bilateral ptosis. Usually the eyes are fixed below horizontal as we see in this patient. And it's due to a mutation in the KIF21A gene, which is a kinesis motor program, which is responsible for axonal transport in neurons. So that goes with a CC. DD. CFEOM type 2 is autosomal recessive. We see these more in consanguineous uh, uh, marriages, bilateral external ophthalmoplegia ptosis, eyes fix in abduction with exotropia, uh, PHOX2A uh, mutations, which is a homeodomain transcription factor program and protein, and again, required for development of cranial nerves 3 and four. So again, makes sense in the sense in, in that this is a CCDD. Um, CFEOM type three is autosomal dominant, some phenotypic overlap with CFEOM type one, but more, uh, you know, two genes that have, that have been uh, identified for this. <laughs> Treatment for congenital fibrosis of the extraocular muscles is really first and foremost trying to place the eyes in primary position. This can be very difficult for the strabismus surgeons, and then we're going to have to elevate the eyelids. And so often what we'll do is, um, you know, try to get the strabismus taken care of first. But the problem is, is that once you bring those eyes up, you have significant ptosis. So the surgeries need to be performed relatively soon. And the ptosis is usually performed with some type of frontalis suspension, but it needs to be conservative because these patients have no Bell's phenomenon. So we need to be careful with regards to dryness. Third condition is lymphedema dystichiasis syndrome, again, an autosomal dominant syndrome, dystichiasis of the upper and lower lids, and then lymphedema of the extremities. This is an interesting condition in the sense that I'll see a fair number of these patients. They come in, um, you know, referred usually for what, you know, but for trichiasis. And then you sort of look at these patients and you sort of see these, this extra low row of lashes coming from the meibomian glands. So not many things cause dystichiasis in kids that isn't associated with, with, uh, with this syndrome. So FOXC2 is the gene, widespread expression of this gene. And I think it's really interesting because when you start talking to these to the parents, you know, usually one of the parents has had this problem as well. And then you ask about lymphedema, they'll usually deny it and say that, no, I just have really bad varicose veins in my legs. And so, you know, it's it's just sort of interesting because you'll pick up this lymphedema in various ways. Um, lots of variability of expression, intrafamilial variation. You know, I've also seen patients with congenital heart disease as well as cleft palates with this uh, problem. But this is what dystichiasis looks like. So here are the normal row of lashes up top. And then what you see are these extra lashes coming from the bibomian gland orifices. Not many things cause this, okay? And, you know, it's usually referred for trichiasis, um, which, you know, in my mind, trichiasis is relatively rare in kids. You know, this is usually going to be dystichiasis or, you know, it's going to be a patient that's being sent over for epiblepharon. So treatment for this patient, for this can be relatively difficult. Um, my current treatment for this is to split the lid at the gray line and then cryo the posterior lamella to kill the lash follicles. And I think that works pretty well. 
Um, I haven't found something that I feel that works a lot better than that. So that's my current treatment for this particular condition. Lastly, for the eyelid congenital conditions, congenital myasthenic syndromes, I think this is relatively rare, probably shouldn't be included today. But, you know, multiple genes uh, are involved in the structures of the neuro of neuromuscular transcription. This can be presynaptic, synaptic, or postsynaptic. But realistically, over half of these cases are due to postsynaptic mutations, usually mutations in the acetylcholine receptor subunit. So this is an autosomal recessive uh, disease, most commonly. And, you know, lots of risk of exposure keratopathies in these patients. They have really poor orbicularis tone. They have poor Bell's phenomenon. And, you know, basically, I usually try to do surgery relatively early in these patients because I know that their pulmonary function gets worse as they get older. So in some ways, it sounds counterintuitive. Early surgery is almost better just because they're a little healthier with regards to their pulmonary function. And so I'll often take these patients to surgery relatively early rather than waiting later. So let's switch gears and now talk about non-congenital rare. So it seems like, well, if it's a genetic syndrome, it should be congenital. But realistically, we have a few conditions that are that that affect the eyelids that you know, basically don't present themselves until later in life. And so usually this is chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, or myotonic dystrophy. And in all of these conditions, you are going to get a progressive myogenic ptosis. So that's different from what we were talking about with BPES or CFEOM in the sense that that ptosis is relatively static, not really progressive. Whereas in these adult onset conditions or later in life onset conditions, it's going to be more uh, progressive ptosis. So CPEO, chronic progressive external, external ophthalmoplegia is due to mitochondrial dysfunction, slowly progressive bilateral ocular immobility, as well as ptosis. And so, uh, you know, to diagnosis, I still do muscle biopsies. I just biopsy either the deltoid or the uh, vastus lateralis. Um, and basically, you're just going to have the pathologist look for ragged red fibers. The reason we don't do mutational analysis, I think it's hard to do mutational analysis on these patients just because there's so many genes that can be involved. Um, wide spectrum of disease. I mean, I'll see patients that are in their 60s that, you know, you look at them, you say, oh, they have CPEO. And then you have these early onset patients in their, you know, under the age of 10, where, you know, they have what is essentially current Sayre syndrome. So that's ophthalmoplegia, retinal pigmentary changes, cardiac conduction disorders, et cetera. I think it's important to remember if you see those early onset CPO, CPEO patients is that they need to be sent for cardiac evaluation because they can have uh, they can have heart block. So really important to remember. Um, CPO, uh, CPEO inheritances is relatively complex because basically this is a mitochondrial problem and, you know, you have uh, proteins in the mitochondria that are made by mitochondrial DNA, but also you have nuclear uh, po proteins that can affect mitochondrial functions. So that's how you can have mitochondrial DNA issues, which be, would be inherited maternally since you get all of your mitochondria from your uh uh, mother, or you can have autosomal uh, dominant or recessive disorders that are that can affect mitochondrial function. Um, it's always important. So you'll see a ton of variability of expression in these patients. So you'll have family members that, you know, are not affected at all. And then you'll have family members that are relatively severely affected. And that is due to the fact that you have multiple strands of DNA, of mitochondrial DNA in your mitochondria. And then that proportion can vary between the mitochondria in your body. And so that's basically heteroplasmy as well as homoplasmy, and that can affect the severity of the disease. Um, so sort of, you know, patient, you know, early age, he's about nine or so here, and then here he is later in life. He's had a sling done, but, you know, these are tough patients to take care of because, you know, I always say that they can't move their eyes, they can't close their eyes, and they can't open their eyes. And so, you know, they have no Bell's phenomenon, they have poor orbicularis function, and they have ptosis. And so you're trying to open the eyes enough so that they can see, but not so much that you cause significant problems with regards to dryness. 
And so now you can sort of see that, you know, motility here is okay at this early age, but as he will get older, that motility will worsen. Oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy is an autosomal dominant disorder. You know, usually these patients uh, present symptoms in their fifth or sixth decade, so they go through life relatively well. But by the age of 70, 99% penetrance. Classically, we say that, you know, the largest populations are in French Canadians, so in Quebec. After that, Bukhara Jews, and then also in the state of New Mexico and the United States, Hispanic patients. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the sense that I used to work in New Mexico, and I literally used to see two new patients every week with OPMD. So saw a ton of patients with OPMD. This is due to a short triplet ex replete expansion in the PABP in one gene. Um, and, you know, uh, again, usually autosomal dominant, so you're going to see large families with this problem. They're going to have ptosis, they're going to have dysphagia, and then later in life, they have proximal muscle weakness. So the swallowing issues can be difficult to pick up, and, um, you know, patients will often deny that they have swallowing issues. And I always say the best way to determine that is to, you know, look at their spouse or their partner and say, how long does it take them to, to finish a meal? And, you know, what that spouse will say is that, you know, I'm washing the dishes and they're still eating because they have learned to eat incredibly slowly so that they don't choke. When I did my internship in New Mexico, the place that I actually first encountered these patients was in the ICU because these patients would get aspiration pneumonia. And so it's very interesting, you know, sort of my history with, with OPMD patients because I've, I've dealt with them for many, many years and first encountered them even before they, you know, I knew it was an eye problem more than anything else. Next, myotonic, myotonic dystrophy, again, an autosomal dominant uh, condition, triplet e repeat expansion in DMPK. So the difference between this triplet repeat expansion and the one in uh, OPMD is that this is a really big uh, triplet repeat expansion. And it's an unstable repeat and repeat length is actually correlated with disease severity and onset. So if they have a long, long repeat, they're going to have uh, earlier onset and more severity. And also you'll see anticipation in the pedigree, meaning that you'll see triplet expansion, uh, triplet repeat expansion as you proceed down the pedigree. So grandparents will be less affected than their grandchildren. You know, myotonia is the big thing we talk about in myotonic dystrophy. So that's a delay in muscle relaxation after, con after contraction. So if you shake their hand, they sort of have a hard time letting go of your hand. Also, cardiac conduction abnormalities. Cataract surgeons will talk, talk to you about polychromatic or Christmas tree cataracts, um, frontal balding, hypogonadism, uh, you know, similar to what we see in CPEO, but a lot more orbicularis weakness. So often you'll see these patients in your clinic and you're trying to figure out, okay, which one do they have? Do they have CPEO? Do they have myotonic or do they have OPMD? In CPEO, you know, again, myotonic myopathy, they're going to have eventual bells, uh, an eventual poor bells and an eventual poor orbicularis uh, function. And myotonic autosomal dominant, also eventual poor bills and also eventual poor orbicularis function, although I think the orbicularis fun function is worse than what I say in CPEO. So these are difficult conditions to treat CPEO and myotonic dystrophy just because of this orbicularis weakness. However, in OPMD and also the lack of Bell's phenomenon. However, OPMD is much easier to treat in the sense that your Bell's is usually retained and your orbicularis is usually retained. So if you're going to treat one of these conditions uh, easily, you're going to be able to treat OPMD. And like I say, I feel strongly that progressive myogenic ptosis is best treated with a primary silicone frontalis uh, sling. Um, you know, I like silicone for adults with this problem. Again, I don't use a lot of silicone in kids anymore. I use more frontalis flaps, but I like silicone because it's elastic and it's also adjustable. And so, like I said, when I was in New Mexico, I saw a ton of patients. I saw a couple hundred patients with this problem. So I, I have a lot of experience with, with OPMD in particular. And I feel strongly that even if they have good levator function, you treat them with a silicone frontalis sling because I know that that levator function is eventually going to be poor in their life. And repeated surgeries result in difficulty with closure, more scar, more orbicularis weakness. So 
give them one surgery, give them a, a, a silicone frontalis sling. You'll probably have to adjust it a little bit. If they live long enough, you might have to even repeat it. But realistically, I think a frontalis sling works very, very well, uh, silicone. And fried principles, I always say, tarsal fixation of the sling. Don't cut away a lot of fat. Don't cut away a lot of skin. Retroceptal placement of the sling and then incorporation of the aponeurosis into the closure. This is one of my favorite pictures. These two guys are twins with oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. And the one on the right, he has had his surgery. The one on the left, he hasn't had his surgery yet. You can really see sort of the big difference between the two patients, you know, before and after surgery. You make a big change in their life when you do this surgery. So let's talk about lacrimal system issues now. I think this is this is a little more complex in the sense that there's wide variability of expression in these inherited conditions of lacrimal system, often incomplete penetrance. And I always say that if you run into a child with some of these issues, uh, you know, punctal agenesis, um, you know, anything that you think may be it look like one of these conditions, always look closely at the parents because they may have um you know some of the signs of this of of this disorder of these disorders but again there's lots of variability so they may not even know that they have this problem as well when i classify these i really classify them with regards to gene defects and i think that you know first and foremost we look at defects in the fibroblast growth factor 10 gene and its associated receptors then we look at defects in TP60, TP63, and then we sort of have um, structural issues, so disorders affecting the development of the branchial apparatus, and then also disorders associated with autonomic dysfunction, such as Riley Day syndrome. Um, first and foremost, let's talk about FGF10, FGFR2, and FGFR3. So basically, these are these are really interesting diseases in the sense that what you see when you have mutations in these genes is that you get, get aplasia or hypoplasia of the lacrimal glands, as well as some of the other salivary glands. And you can also get dysgenesis or agenesis of a lacrimal excretory apparatus, so lacrimal obstruction. Uh, and so, you know, basically two conditions that we usually, that are, that are uh, related um, phenotypes, basically. And, you know, one is ALSG, which is aplasia of the lacrimal and salivary glands, and the other is LADD, which is lacrimal auricular dental digital syndrome. And these are, these have a lot of overlap and um, in their, in their presentation. So ALSG is interesting. You know, this is an autosomal dominant uh, syndrome, uh, absence of the lacrimal gland, lacrimal drainage apparatus, absence of the salivary glands. So one thing that I want you to take away from this with regards to looking at inherited conditions of the lacrimal system is always look at their teeth because, you know, when you don't make saliva, your teeth are really bad. Early in life, they lose their teeth before the age of 20. Okay. A lot of them will. So they get dental erosion, dental caries, a lot of periodontal disease. Um, and like I said, lots of variability with regards to lacrimal drainage findings. And I think you have to differentiate this from Sjogren's in the sense that usually in Sjogren's patients, the lacrimal glands are enlarged. So let's look at this 25-year-old guy who came into my clinic complaining of chronic ocular irritation. And he told me, he said, I do not make tears. And he uses artificial tears, not with a lot of relief. And he said that his sister has a similar problem. And when I palpate the lacrimal sac, I saw reflux. And so this is what his scan looks like. And if you look at his lacrimal sacs here, they are dilated. So he has a nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. But when we look for his lacrimal glands, he has no lacrimal glands. And so here's his axial CT, absolutely no lacrimal glands at all. And then we look here, no parotid glands. And what you really notice though, is that he has, you know, we always say, well, what's missing in this, in this, uh, in this 3D reconstruction? Orbits look fine, everything looks fine, but absolutely no teeth at all. Well, he might have one tooth down here, one, one lower molar left over, but realistically, he has lost all of his teeth. And so this is a 25 year old guy. So, you know, a little strange. So anyway, he had agenis ALSG. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about ways to treat this. So LADD is 
autosomal dominant, also agenesis of lack of excretory apparatus, aplasia of hypo, uh, or hypoplasia of salivary glands as well as lacrimal glands. So a lot of overlap with ALSG, but you also have some of these other issues, limbal cell, cell deficiency, as well as digital abnormality. So a little more severe than just garden variety ALSG. And so here, what you see in this patient, so lower puncta are fine, upper puncta are absent. And I know that in a busy clinic, it's hard sometimes to look for the upper puncta, but just look in these patients that, you know, potentially have some of these conditions and also look at the parents, you know, because sometimes they're just missing one of four puncta, but it gives you an idea of, okay, what may be going on in these patients. So, um, you know, in these patients that have lacrimal outflow obstruction, but also uh, agenesis of the lacrimal gland, you know, reestablishing lacrimal outflow often causes worsening dry eye. So if they have NLDO, I actually do a, a dacrocystectomy because part of the problem is, is that they just have their eyes just bathing in this mucoid reflux from their dilated lacrimal sac. So the best thing to do in these patients, because they don't tear, they just have this chronic irritation from the this reflux that they have from the lacrimal sac. So I'll do a dacrocystectomy in these patients rather than try to uh, improve their lacrimal outflow, because I know that if I improve their lacrimal outflow, I'm going to cause some really bad dry eye. So TP63, Cree regulator of ectodermal orofacial limb development. And so what do we see in autosomal dominant TP63 disease? Uh, we have basically a lot of um, syndromes that have a lot of overlap. And so, you know, these are all TP63 associated disease and all have some overlap with regards to their uh, their presentation. The thing to remember on these is that it's really not a lacrimal gland problem. Their lacrimal glands are, are fine. It's usually more lacrimal outflow obstruction, but it can be tricky because they often have teeth issues as well. So, you know, if you take away from this lecture that, oh, if they have a lacrimal problem, I need to look at their teeth. If they don't have teeth, then they must have ALSG or LADD. Well, that's not true because now we're looking at TP63, which doesn't cause any problems with their lacrimal gland, but really causes problems with ectodermal uh, uh, development. So they'll often have teeth problems, not due to a lack of saliva, but due to uh, ectodermal dysplasia, essentially. And so you'll see a lot of punctal agenesis in these patients, canalicular agenesis, as well as nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Like I said, there's a lot of overlap between these guys. So ectodermal dysplasia, cleft lip and palate, and then you have limb defects. And so in each of these syndromes, you'll get some overlap. And so it can, I think it's not important really to sort of split these up in the TP63 related conditions, but just sort of to understand, okay, TP63, presents a little differently than the FGFR10 and its related receptor problems. Um, so, you know, this is what these teeth look like. So this is a kid that's only, I think she was, you know, 10 or 11 years old. And, you know, this is what we're seeing is we're seeing these, just these teeth that are just lousy. So she's not losing her teeth because of a problem with saliva production, she's losing her teeth because of an ectodermal dysplasia, essentially. You'll see these limb abnormalities and ectodermal uh, dysplasia, so sort of the, what we call lobster claw abnormalities. And then you can even see this ankyloblepharon in that we see in AEC. So like I said, tear, tear production is usually normal in TP63 related disease. Basically what you're trying to do is reestablish lacrimal outflow more than anything else. So in FGF, R10 and its related receptors. I'm going to usually do a dacrocystectomy for those patients because they have no tears that are being made and they don't tear. They just have irritation from their mucoid reflux from the lacrimal sac. Whereas in TP63 related disease, you know, the lacrimal drainage is affected, but their lacrimal production is actually fine. So things to think about with regards to these. Uh, you know, branchial apparatus associated di disorders are really structural defects. So these are, you know, we see branchial acrofacial syndrome uh, and some of these other ones, um, you know, I, these are very rare, um, don't see a lot of these, but, you know, this isn't due to a primary problem with the lacrimal glands or the lacrimal uh, outflow. This is more due to structural issues related to the clefts that you see in these problems. 
Now, with regards to disorders associated with autonomic dysfunction, um, you know, we have AAA syndrome, which is autosomal recessive. And then we have also familial dysautonomia, which is Riley Day syndrome. And so Riley Day is going to be the one that you're going to, you know, hear more about autosomal recessive, more, you know, seeing more in Ashkenazi Jews, um, IKP gene, and, you know, basically incomplete accessory and autonomic. Uh, neurodevelopment. So a lacrima, corneal anesthesia, that's hard to treat because you have know, patients that don't make tears and they don't feel when their eyes are getting into trouble. So the lacrimal glands are histologically normal in these patients. So if you do a scan, you're going to see lacrimal glands, but they're just not innervated. So they do have a lacrima, but not due to an absence of lacrimal glands, but due to a poor innervation of the lacrimal glands. Um, so that's basically it for lacrimal disorders. So again, think of it as FGFR10 and its related receptor genes. That's going to cause agenesis of the lacrimal glands and salivary glands, as well as problems with lacrimal outflow. Usually going to treat that more with a dacrocystectomy rather than uh, trying to improve lacrimal outflow. Then you have TP63, and which is more like ectodermal problems, development, mental problems. And, you know, that's more lacrimal outflow issues, but lacrimal glands are fine. So you're really going to treat that by trying to reestablish lacrimal outflow. Then you have it's more of the structural issues, and then you have uh, autonomic di dysfunction. So I think that if you think of lacrimal inherited lacrimal issues in that way, it's simplistic, but I think that it's a, for, for what you need to know, I think that that's really the most important thing to know for these patients, because you don't want to miss, you know, things like dysautonomia. I mean, this is a potentially fatal disease. So, you know, Riley Day syndrome, we want to uh, keep an eye about. All right. So lastly, what we're going to talk about is inherited orbital disorders. And so when I split these up, I really split these up into a problem of proliferation meaning tumor suppressor genes or arrest. And what I mean that is that there's the developmental process is prematurely terminated. And this can either be soft tissue or this can be bony. So when we talk about proliferation disorders, um, neurofibromatosis type one, neurofibromatosis type two, basal nevus syndrome, neurotore syndrome, familial adenomas, polyposis, uh, cherubism, osteopetrosis, and then we have some of these sarcomas uh, that are related to retinoblastoma. And then you have Lee Fermani syndrome, which is also sort of a early sarcoma uh, associated with tumor suppressor gene uh, mutation. Um, so, you know, NF1, something that I think that you are definitely going to encounter in your career, even if you don't do oculoplastic surgery, just because, you know, these patients get glaucoma, they could get other issues and, you know, you're going to see this. Um, so, you know, autosomal dominant condition, 100% penetrance by the age of five. So if you have the mutation in the gene, you are going to have penetrance, but you're going to show evidence of the disease by the age of five. However, there's significant variability in expression. You have patients that are relatively mild and you have patients that are much more severe. Um, you know, they do have these plexiform neurofibromas, which to me is one of the hardest things that I take care of. It can be extremely challenging to surgically treat plexiform neurofibromas, sphenoid wing dysplasia, and, you know, the gene has been identified, one of the early genes identified by linkage analysis, our positional cloning back in the late 80s, um, neurofibromin, tumor suppressor gene, silence is activated RAS. So this is a proto- oncogene uh, RAS. Um, I think it's good to know the diagnostic criteria of uh, NF1 just because it's one of the more common genetic disorders. And I think you need to have, well, diagnostic criteria is that you have to have at least a, two of the following, six or more cafe au lait spots, two or more neurofibromas, or one plexiform neurofibroma, freckling in the axillary or inguinal regions, optic nerve glioma, two or more Lish nodules, distinctive osse osseous lesions such as sphenoid wing dysplasia and or a first degree relative with NF1. So, you know, whenever these kids come into my clinic, um, I strip them down. You know, I think, <laughs> you know, the parents are always trying to figure out why I want to have them take, why I want to have the child take the shirt off. Well, I'm going to look for cafe au lait spots. I'm going to look for axillary freckling. And so, 
And it's sort of embarrassing when you when you discover that in the operating room because that's when they have their their shirt off and you say, oh, there's frax, there's a lot of cafe away spots or there's axial freckling and I missed it. So, you know, in these kids, you know, that you suspect, you know, you're a doctor first and foremost. And so, you know, take their shirts off, look at their underarms, look on their back, on their trunk, look for cafe away spots. Lish nodules pop up later. Um, and then obviously optic gliomas, you're not going to detect really without imaging. So, you know, this can be tricky. So this is a young child who came in for a congenital ptosis. And, you know, you, it's in a busy clinic, it would be really easy to blow her off and just say, oh, congenital ptosis, we're going to lift your lid. But, you know, you need to look at the shape of that lid. You need to notice that, gosh, she has a pretty significant temporal droop, almost even a little S-shaped curve to her lid. But she has a plexiform nerve fibroma that's causing this, and she has a mother with NF1. And so, you know, without knowing that her mother had nerve fibromatosis type 1, I will very possible that I could have missed this in clinic. And so, you know, keep your level of suspicion up, you know, get really, you know, try not, to, it's easy to miss these. You know, I'm never going to fault someone if they miss a early NF1 because it can be really easy to miss, but at the same time, just, you know, have your, have, have that, you know, that level of suspicion up in these patients, especially when they have more of a temporal ptosis, especially, you know, when you have a little bit of an S shape. Uh, abnormality to the nerve. Um, you know, this is imaging for plexiform, and this can be also tricky. Also, this can be tricky, you know, because I've had radiologists misread these for capillary hemangiomas. You know, the difference between capillary hemangiomas and plexiforms is that, you know, this plexiform is usually going to grow over time and it's going to pop up later in uh, childhood, whereas, you know, capillary hemangiomas should be something that pop up at about two months of age. So a little different, but it can be difficult at times, you know, if you have a patient that has an early plexiform and you're trying to figure out, okay, is this capillary hemangioma or is this plexiform? But always, always keep that in mind. Um, you know, optic nerve glioma sort of have this kink in the optic nerve, they're, you know, pathognomonic for an optic nerve glioma, you know, so keep these in mind. Um, and, you know, this is just an example of sort of the osseous abnormalities you can get in these patients. So 3D reconstruction on this side, on the left side, doing absolutely fine. You can see the sphenoid wing dysplasia, and that's usually due to an expansion of the trigeminal nerve going through the superior orbital fissure. So, you know, is it really sphenoid wing dysplasia or is it just an expansion of that foramina due to our foramen, due to, uh, you know, expansion of the trigeminal nerve from the uh, plexiform nerve fibroma that they also have. But you can really see, you know, how much distortion of the bone this patient has from their disease. I mean, this is can be a disfiguring disease. Like I said, um, you know, surgery on these patients is usually very unrewarding in my mind. Uh, you know, it's really rare for me to do surgery on a patient that has a big plex form and at the end of it say, wow, that was a home run. I did great. You know, it's really sort of, mm, okay, we did all right. But, you know, I, no way would I say that it's that it's perfect. Um, one of the exciting things that is coming out is that MEK inhibitors are showing um, success in decreasing the volume of plex form neurofibromas. So in those patients, I now send them for uh, possible treatment with selumetinib. So I send them to the pediatric oncologist and see if we can get any improvement. I'd much rather do that than try to do surgery on these plexiform neurofibromas. So, you know, this is from the New England Journal article. I'm not seeing this type of responses. I'm seeing stabilization, maybe a little bit improvement. But, you know, I'm not seeing these huge home runs that we're seeing here in these pictures. Now, NF2, I think, is one of the worst diseases I, I see. I think I hate NF2. I really do because it kills patients. So NF2, you know, NF1 is usually doesn't kill my patient, but NF2 can kill my patients, okay? They get bad meningiomas. They, you know, have a lot of bad problems that go on later in life. I mean, these if, if there's one disease that I wish I had a cure for, it would be NF2. Uh, this is autosomal dominant disease, neurofibroma 2, gene, tumor suppressor gene, bilateral vestibular schwannomas. So they lose their hearing. They often use facial nerve function, uh, meningiomas, ependiomas, uh, 
neurofibromas and then, uh, you know, posterior subcapsular cataracts and also retinal membranes. So that's another thing that you see. So, you know, optic nerve meningioma over here. And then you have this patient that has significant meningiomas of the skull base, you know, with NF2. So really frustrating disease to treat. You know, when are, why are we treating these patients? Well, we see a lot of facial nerve palsies in these patients. We see a lot of optic nerve meningiomas in these patients. And, um, you know, I've even seen uh, orbital schwannomas in these patients. Um, so, you know, the problem is, is that we really need to be careful with vision of these patients because they often have hearing impairment. So they're going to lose their hearing often due to their acoustic neuroma. And then often they will have problems with facial nerve palsy. And so these guys, these are two brothers with NF2. And, you know, both of them have facial nerve palsy. Both of them are having a hard time. So I'll usually send these patients, you know, I'll, I'll load their upper lid but I usually send them for uh, scleral lens therapy as well. I think scleral lenses have saved my lives in these in these patients. Uh, so NF2, really frustrating uh, disease, and I'm I'm hopeful that we're going to have a, a better molecular treatment of this disease with time. Basal cell nevus syndrome, again, autosomal dominant, multiple base cell carcinomas, an inhibitor of you know gene is known PTCH1. Um, you know, what are the findings in these patients? We see these patients and, you know, this is, again, sort of a spectrum of disease. I'll see early patients with this problem that popping up basal cells, you know, in the before the age of 10. And then I'll see patients that are in their 30s that stop, pop, start popping up a lot of basal cells that, you know, also have uh, basal cell nevus syndrome. Odontogenic keratosis of the jaws, palmer or plantar pits. Um, and so lots of other findings that we'll see in these patients. So look at them. You know, look at their hands. You know, it's really interesting. I, whenever I see a basal cell nevus syndrome patient, I always want to look at their palms, see if they have these little palmer pits. But you can see in this patient, multiple basal cells already. And basically, you know, the way in which you treated this was, you know, just slow, uh, you know, slow excision of a lot of these basal cells. So not ideal treatment for these patients in the old days. Also, you'll see these tarsal cysts. I love to see this finding. I love to show this to my residents because I think I could show this to you and ask you what disease do they have? Because not many things do this other than basal cell nevus syndrome. The beauty of treatment now is that we do have a better treatment for this other than surgery. And so vismotigib and sonidogib, these are inhibitors of the hedgehog signaling pathway. Um, you know, the great thing about this is that uh, it it definitely helps in these patients with basal cell nevus syndrome. The bad thing about this is that they do have that they you do have significant side effects from the medications, and so much so that about thirty percent of patients will stop the medication due to these side effects. But this came, this is from you know one of the original publications out of the New England Journal, uh, patient before and after treatment with. Uh, this Motigib patient with basal cell nevus syndrome. So no surgery at all, shrinkage of this, but again, you know, lots of side effects from this medication. So I think it's an exciting time. I mean, I have much better treatment than the old. I had, I, you know, sadly, you know, 15 years ago, I had a patient uh, commit suicide because of that had basal cell nevus syndrome. And so it's a not, it is a very um, unpleasant, disease to have. I don't know if there's an, ever any pleasant disease to have, but this is one that basically disfigures you. And so, you know, it's not a great disease to have in these patients. So I'm very hopeful that medical therapy such as Vizmodigib uh, is going to improve even more and more in the treatment of these patients. Um, I bring up familial adenomatous polyposis just because we sometimes see orbital lesions, in particular osteomas. And so, if you have that patient that has an osteoma in the uh, orbit, or if they have multiple osteomas, always sort of step back and try to ask yourself whether they could have this problem. And they also, you know, this is sort of classically what we're taught in ophthalmology, these chirpies that you'll see. And um, so, you know, always dilate these patients if you suspect that maybe they have FAP. Cherubism, less... Uh, less common, autosomal dominant, facial swelling, uh, giant repair, cell reparative granulomas. And so just keep you keep in mind that in these patients that have giant cell reparative uh, granulomas and also facial swelling that they could have 
cherubism. Um, with regards to hereditary sarcomas, I think I most commonly see these in patients uh, with retinoblastoma. So always keep in mind in your retinoblastoma patients that they have the possibility for second primary tumors. We always say that here in the United States and in most nations, you know, primary retinoblastoma doesn't kill our patients. It's the secondary sarcomas that pop up later in life. And basically we say that the risk for that is 1% per year of life. You know, here's a patient with a meningioma that's popped up. She was enucleated on the other side. And now here's her meningioma. And, you know, these always seem to pop up on the side of the remaining eye, never pops up in the side of the anophthalmic socket. Here's a patient that really unfortunate patient. And this is just an example of a patient that had uh, uh, retinoblastoma going down their optic nerve and intracranially. So terrible, terrible uh, case of, uh, of extension. Um, again, another patient, uh, there's their anophthalmic side on the left. And then of course they popped up this liposarcoma on the side of their only seen eye. So really frustrated to see, and we see this predisposition in retinoblastoma patients. Uh, you know, with regards to hereditary sarcomas, I think this is always something to keep in mind, especially see if you see a young patient with a sarcoma. And I'm not talking about a rhabdomyosarcoma. I'm talking about any of the other sarcomas, liposarcomas, osteosarcomas, et cetera. So, you know, there are these autosomal dominant cancer syndromes out there. So if you see that patient with an early sarcoma, always get them checked. You know, TP53, so this is not the TP63 that we talked about earlier for lacrimal problems. This is TP53 that uh, will predispose, if you have mutations in this gene, you are predisposed to developing sarcomas. And what I think is really important to remember, and if you remember one thing from this, uh, this syndrome, is that if you suspect this, do not treat them with radiation because young sarcoma patients, if they already have one hit in this P TP53 and you treat them with radiation, you are definitely gonna cause problems for them later in life with regards to kicking up more sarcomas. So uh, this these can be very difficult situations to take care of because basically, you know, you'll have a one or two year old with a sarcoma you have them checked for the TP53. They do have a TP53 mutation. And, you know, the treatment for that, if you're going to try to avoid sarcoma, is going to be radical excision. And so then you're talking about, you know, exoneration of a two-year-old, which is a hard discussion with parents. But, you know, again, I would do everything I could to try to not treat these patients with radiation at this point in time until we have better medical treatments for this patient. Um, you know, with regards to somatic mosaic, so these are patients that really don't have germline mutations. I just add this in here for completeness. So these are patients who have a proportion, you know, basically uh, after development or, or during development, they pop a mutation in a population of their cells in a proportion of their cells. So things like McCune-Albright, Sturge-Weber, Proteus syndrome, these are more mosaic, somatic mosaics. We'll also see somatic mosaics in NF1 in the sense that, you know, this is what we call segmental NF1, where, you know, you see the patient, they have this huge plexiform, you say, this is NF, this is NF1, they have nothing else in their body that has, uh, you know, no cafe au lait, no lish nodules anywhere no, um, you know, other signs of NF1. And so we'll say, well, that's a somatic mosaic. That is a segmental NF1. So things to think about. Um, just one of my patients with McCune Albright, you know, multiple uh, bones, mon uh, polyostotic uh, uh, fibrous dysplasia, um, really hard patients to treat, you know, to take care of. Um, Lastly, we're going to talk about disorders secondary to arrest. We have a few minutes here. Uh, so with regards to soft tissue, this is going to be microphthalmia. With regards to bone, this is really going to be craniosynostosis. Okay. Microphthalmia, failure of the optic vesicle to develop. Uh, this can be unilateral, bilateral, colobomas of the choroid, orbital cysts, lots of genes involved. You know, over 10, 20 genes to, uh, involved with uh, with um uh, microphthalmia, a lot of homeobox genes, a lot of developmental genes. You know, here's patient microphthalmic eye. They have this little cyst behind it. Uh, so you can see the small eye compared to the other side. I think what's important to remember is that, you know, we depend upon 
a normal sized eye for bony development around this. So we, you know, in this adult, you can see how everything on this side of his face is smaller. And so this is why it's so important to treat these patients with expansion. So how we treat these patients, conservative expansion with enlarging conformers. I'll put in a lot of dermis fat grafts if I think that conservative expansion isn't working. I always have these patients evaluated by genetics and I always get imaging on these patients. Now, with regards to bony arrest around the orbit, really this is craniosynostoses, clefts, and then also hypertelorism. You know, syndromic craniosynostoses that we see that affect the eyes. Um, you know, these are usually autosomal dominant fibroblast growth factor receptor genes. So similar to what we talked about earlier with ALSG and LADD, but in a different one, lots of fiber best growth factor receptors, um, Apert syndrome, Crusone syndrome, Pfeiffer syndrome. With regards to clefts, Treacher Collins, Golden Har, frontal nasal dysplasia, and this is just an example of a patient with untreated, unfortunately, uh, later in life, she's in her early 20s, untreated Treacher Collins syndrome. So I've written a bit on these and, you know, this was just sort of a review of uh, these three papers. If you want to, you know, look these up a little bit more, I put this back in current opinion in ophthalmology a little over 10 years ago or about 10 years ago, just looking at each of the hereditary conditions of the eyelid, lacrimal system, and then orbital disorders. So if you want to get into more details about these, feel free to read these papers. It's really been great to be here. I really appreciate the attention. Thank you so much for the invitation. Would love to talk more uh, at, at another time if you would like to, and happy to take any questions if there are already. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, congenital anomalies is a task and a very challenging uh, case for us to deal with and to treat, and you have covered it beautifully well. Um, especially the examples that you've given and the experiences that you went through, I think will help us too, uh, because those are the real uh, nitty gritty things that we need to really focus upon. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, sir. Uh, may I take it with your permission? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, the first question is, uh, what role does systemic medical therapy such as targeted molecular therapies or immunotherapies play in the management of an advanced or unresectable orbital tumor of NF1 patients, neurofibromatosis patients. Yeah, NF1. So immunotherapy, I mean, really, it's going to be selumetinib. Uh, MEK inhibitors, I think, would be what I would... That's the only thing that's out there right now that is proven. So immunotherapy, I don't think, has any role in the treatment of... Um, so you're talking about checkpoint inhibitors, either through the CTLA-4 or PD-1 pathway. And I think uh, no role with regards to NF1 that I know of, that I know of any evidence are. Right now, most of the evidence, most of what people are talking about are, are MEK inhibitors. So that's selumetinib. It's hard, you know, not hard, but like I said, I, I think when I have my patients treated with that, I don't get a, a huge reversal. If anything, I see sort of stabilization, maybe a little bit of, a, of an improvement. And I'm hoping that with time, we're going to have better treatment for that. With MEK inhibitors, it's always important to remember that you have to have these patients have a dilated exam every about, you know, four to six months because you can get this MEK associated retinopathy and basically it's a serous attachment, a detachment of the, of the retina. Okay. And that can be hard Thank in kids, you. that can be hard in kids, you know, so uh, to detect that you have to get OCT basically. Okay, so the second question is, uh, what is the ideal approach of treatment in a patient with Crozen syndrome? With cruisons, <laughs> you know, I, I leave it to my craniofacial surgeons, you know, so I'm pretty secondary with regards to those ones. So, um, you know, they'll do, um, you know, a lot of orbital expansion and um, I, I really leave it to them. They do sort of the primary surgery and then later on we'll do a lot of revisions with regards to the uh, eyelids or the cantal abnormalities. Um, but usually... In, at least in my practice, I'm, I'm, I have, you know, I'm fortunate to have some um, really good cranial facial surgeons to work with that are available and it will help me out in those patients. But I mean, first and foremost with those patients, I mean, you can get some optic nerve issues. Obviously, a lot of it is corneal uh, protection. And so early on, you know, we're really trying to protect the cornea more than anything else. And 
then eventually they're going to have the cranial facial surgery performed. Um, and then after that is usually when I'm going to be involved. Early on, the only time that I'm really involved is if, you know, they have really bad exposure, they're waiting for surgery, and I'm going to do maybe a tarsor if you to just protect the eye more than anything else. Again, you can't do a complete tarsor if you're on these patients. It's usually going to be lateral um, to protect the cornea. But, you know, obviously we have amblyopia concerns as well. Okay, so, and the last question is, uh, can orbital anomalies be detected by fetal scans? And if so, when do we uh, ideally do it? Which abnormalities? Can all, any, I'm sorry. Uh, most, uh, any inherited orbital anomalies? You know, those would, can be picked up. Do you have to screen? You know, is there like screening that you would do? These are also rare that you wouldn't screen them unless they had a predisposition or a, predisposition to it due to, um, you know, one of the other family members that were affected. And so maybe you're, uh, you know, you put yourself on a little more alert with regards to talking to the, uh, to the ob uh, but realistically, these are also rare. Can they be picked up? Um, you know, incidentally, absolutely. And, you know, then you can have a, a plan after birth. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. It was wonderful having you join with us and give us your precious time discussing about such a niche topic. Uh, hoping to see you soon, sir, in the next conference. Thank you so much. I really enjoy. Uh, I really enjoyed the you know the invitation. Really appreciate the invitation, and um, you know hope to see you all again soon. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Have a great You're weekend. Welcome. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. A uh, gentle reminder, um, we still have our seats open for the iFocus offline. And this time it's going to be conducted from the June 9th to June 16th at Hyderabad. Hurry up, the registrations are limited only to 300 candidates and it's closing very soon. We started on August 2nd, 2023. And today we have come to the last episode of Oculoplasty. We covered multiple topics from anatomy, surgical experiences, various cases and discussions. We had more than 50 prolific speakers, both national and international level joining us and sharing their experiences and teaching us a whole lot of things. For now, we break for the AIOS National Conference for a week. Our next module is on lens and cataract, and we will be starting on March 20th. Have a great weekend. Hoping to see you in the next class. Thank you. <laughs>